I want to uh, introduce your next speaker, uh, Mike Brown. Mike's an uh, ex-partner of mine in, in Washington. You can read his bio. That'll tell you a little bit about Michael. But what it won't tell you is the commitment and dedication, the relentless passion he has for this job of traffic safety and what he does across the country. Uh, Mike is probably one of the most respected law enforcement executives that I've ever known, certainly as a leader of the California Highway Patrol, one of the largest law enforcement organizations in the world, and probably the premier organization when you think about traffic safety. So Mike comes uh, to us with just great experience and expertise in, in the arena of highway safety. Uh, certainly one of the most dedicated professionals that I've ever met in my long career, uh, both in local community and state and now the federal government. So uh, Michael is fortunate that we're here. He's here with us today. Today is also his wife's birthday. So um, she's back home in Virginia and Mike is with us. So would you join me in, in thanking Mike Brown? Good morning, everybody. It, it is true my wife's birthday is today. I want you to know that I did sing happy birthday to her from my hotel room this morning. And more importantly, I took her out to dinner, a rather expensive dinner on Saturday so that I could be here with you today. It is a pleasure to be here. You know, it's kind of funny. Uh, one of my staff was asking me the other day because we just had some awards for length of service. And somebody said, well, how long have you been doing this? And I really hadn't thought about it. I had to kind of do some math. And next year will be my 40th year in public service. And I got to tell you, all but one of those years has been involved in traffic safety. The colonel and I were talking just at the break. And one of the things that I remember is when I first wanted to be a cop, I wanted to be a crime crushing cop. You know, go out there, be like uh, Adam 12 and take people to jail and wear blue uniforms and all that kind of stuff. And the first ones that offered me a job, again, it was during the post-Vietnam era, was the Highway Patrol in California. And I figured, well, I'll just do this for a while and then I'll go out and be a real crime-crushing cop. I got off a break and I made my first, de first death notification on Christmas Eve. It was an impaired driver crash. A 19-year-old kid was killed and thrown from a Volkswagen. And I went to the door and I knocked on the door. And then it re I realized at that very moment that it really doesn't matter if you die as a result of a fender, a bullet, a knife. To the surviving members of the family, it's incredibly important. And for I was hooked. And for the next 32 years, I was with the patrol, two years as a uh, Secretary of Public Safety, and now due to my good buddy Mike here, convinced to come back to NHTSA. Now, I don't know, get that. As soon as I get back there, he leaves. So what's up with that, Mike? You'll get, you'll catch up. Yeah, I'll catch up. <laughs> I want to talk a little bit about, um, as we talked about, uh, Jake uh, Nelson left out a very good overview of what is facing impaired driving. We at NHTSA look at impaired driving as really driving impaired, and that can be caused by a variety of things. Alcohol is a predominant factor in impaired driving. It's still a predominant factor in impaired driving. But also, drug and alcohol and drugs are emerging as a predominant factor. How big, we don't know. We really don't know. And let me explain some of the reasons why. We do know from our 2007 survey, as, as Jake pointed out, that 16.3% of the population tested positive for drugs in the population that was surveyed or the sample that was surveyed as part of that survey in 2007 and reported in 2009. Problem is, that's just being tested positive. That is not necessarily impairment. That's the presence of drugs. As a result, we're doing a survey right now, which is uh, given some controversy, as a result of the roadside survey trying to be more sensitive in terms of what that uh, actual presence is, so that we can maybe ascertain what level of uh, presence is there in certain types of drugs. It's not without its controversy because some people don't like to be, uh, think that we should be pulling people over on the side of the road, although it's not NHTSA, it's a contractor. In fact, we're actually looking at litigation in Pennsylvania because of it, even though we've used the same methodology for over 40 years. Now, that's one part of our problem. The other part of the problem in drug testing is, frankly, what we find out in our fatal analysis and reporting system. Many of you know it as far as. That's where we have a census data of the number of people that are killed in the United States because 
of our traffic crash, okay? Now, you would think that in alcohol, we would have a pretty good understanding of what the presence of alcohol is in crashes. And yet, we still have a number of states that do not, promote, uh, do not report all of their uh, toxicological assays for alcohol, and we're working to fix that. It's even worse for drugs, and we understand why. Part of it is the same thing that Jake mentioned earlier. Part of it's the cost. Part of it's the different types of sensitivity and technology that's available in labs and the practicality of the labs themselves. So we have this incomplete data set in FARS. We have this incomplete data set or non, not as sensitive data set as far as presence for, for uh, impaired driving under the influence of drugs on the roadside survey. And then you add to that mix the whole issue of whether or not we're going to legalize marijuana for recreational use or for medicinal use. The public policy uh, debates that are taking place in the states across the country are not going unnoticed at NHTSA or at DOT or at the federal level. Many of you uh, probably are aware of the national uh, drug control strategy that was developed by the Office of National Drug Control Policy. Has anyone seen that document? Well, three years ago, for the first time, ONDCP included in the administration's national drug control policy or strategy a specific reference to impaired driving under the influence of drugs for the first time. Question is, how bad is it? Well, again, we don't have all that information. But the fact that they accepted it as a national agenda item is huge. And one of the things that they focused on was the issue of whether or not the, the, the level of prescription drugs is part of the problem. But again, we have a very difficult time trying to deal with that because we have some data, but we don't report it out, generally speaking, because it's an incomplete data set. And we have to get that data from the states. So there's a lot of things going on on driving under the influence of drugs, which are very, very important. And like Jake had mentioned earlier, we have to include alcohol in that mix. Alcohol is a still a big player. Even with the data that we have, number one, fav fav reasons for fatalities involving driving under the influence is alcohol. Next is alcohol and drugs of the data sets that we do have. And third is, of course, just the drugs by themselves, and the presence of it. Now, part of the problem that we have in, in terms of the technology that we have available is, frankly, um, we're asked a lot. For example, when uh, Colorado and Washington were in fact brought, uh, were going to consider doing the recreational marijuana uh, le uh, laws, they asked, what do we do to demonstrate what impairment is for the purposes of driving under the influence? Fair question. So they called us up and asked. And we said, we don't know. And why? Because the science isn't clear. The science is not clear on this. There are studies that are out there that have been debated, peer-reviewed. Some of them, frankly, have been disputed because of the methodologies that are used as terms of impairment. And so in, in case of Colorado, they did, as mentioned earlier, a public policy statement that they're going to use 0.05 nanograms as their threshold. That has yet to be tested in court, to my knowledge, that's gone all the way through and, and, and addressed. Washington, on the other hand, has not adopted a threshold yet. They're still debating what they want to do. So I like, I hearken back to my very first impaired driving arrest that I made in the 70s, which the Colonel and I were kind of chatting about at the break. And I remember, we had the old dial a deuce back then, some of you in the room may remember that, where you had the little ampules, you put it in and you dialed it, and then you had to testify about that later on, about what the level was. Well, this guy came back in 01. And so clearly he's not under the influence of alcohol but he can't stand up straight either. So that's kind of a clue to me that there's something else going on. And it turns out he was on cocaine. But it was Kentucky windage, I gotta tell you. I just, we didn't have DREs back then. We didn't have A-Ride back then. You just, we had this little, you know, two hour class on, on drugs and the synergistic effects of drugs and alcohol. And we kind of looked at it like this and said, uh-huh, I think I'm gonna take him anyway. Why, because he can't stand up. We have a lot more tools today. And some of those tools I want to cover a little bit. The, one of the tools that we have, obviously, is the DEC program. And that includes both the drug recognition expert, which we are pushing uh, dramatically. Mike was in charge of the DRE program when he was in, in, in uh, the Beltway. And we are pushing it across the country. We've revised the, uh, uh, the curriculum. 
we've made it coincide with not only the uh, a ride training but also with the standard field sobriety test training so that they're all uniform in terms of their yeah, how they are approaching the issue of driving under the influence of drugs we've also as many of you know put online to make more accessible the a ride training that was a commitment that we put together with the, uh, the ONDCP to try and get as much basic information out to the officers, the men and women on the street, so that they can understand exactly what they need to do and maybe raise an eyebrow or have the suspicion that more may be involved in this particular stop and this impairment beyond just alcohol. And at that point, call in a DRE or do some other kinds of toxicological assay to find out exactly what's taking place. Now, the other thing that we're also looking at is technology. In the fall of 2012, we brought together manufacturers of technology in terms of drug testing. And we were surprised that they're advancing at a much greater rate than we'd originally thought in terms of their ability to make assays in the field, or at least preliminary assays, as to the presence of drugs. There are several manufacturers that were there. Their association was there. We had people from academia there, all talking about where we need to be, where we will be in a few years, hopefully, and whether or not there's an ability to test it. And I, I'm pleased to say that based on that, right now in California, we have a four demonstration site evaluation of different types of saliva-based testing going on right now. The purpose is to see if we can find a way at the very least, to come up with kind of a past type device for drugs for the officers in the field, if in fact some of this equipment proves to be reliable enough to detect presence. So that's something that's ongoing. We're kind of hoping that within the next year we'll have a report out on that. The other issue we run into is uh, the distinction between alcohol and drugs. We have a 30-year history with alcohol. We're kind of like at the beginning of that very 30-year history with drugs. We now know how well alcohol metabolizes in the system, what the level of impairment is, the uniformity, of, uh, and even the small nuances, which are very small between individuals, weight, sleep, and all that kind of stuff. But the bottom line is we know a lot about alcohol. Many of you have seen a physician's daily reference, that big, thick book. When I first came on, it was that size. Now it's that size, it's huge. Well, we don't know those thresholds for every type of compound that's out there. That was one of the reasons why in the National Drug Control Strategy that the White House and ONDCP suggested that you use per se as a threshold for drug impairment, uh, driving under the influence of drugs. We have 19 states that have a drug impairment law that involves per se. Problem is very few of them use it for the purposes of driving under the influence of drugs. And there's issues about whether the person's impaired or not. That really becomes the purview, if you will, of the toxicologist or the other who comes in and tries to describe the different behaviors, or at least interpret the different behaviors observed by the officer as it is being, you know, with the, with the uh, conditions of the drug and what the drug is likely to take place. It's a very difficult prosecution, and I'm sure Joanne Tompkins will talk a little bit about that later. So we don't have the same thresholds that we do. One of the things that we are trying to do as far as NHTSA is concerned is to try and look at um, doing dosing experiments uh, to try and see if there's an impairment level or a threshold for marijuana. Why marijuana? Well, uh, for the obvious reasons. We've got a lot of concern across the country with medicinal marijuana. We have a lot of concerns across the country, certainly with what's happening in Colorado and Washington. And for that reason, we want to be able to give some indication, if possible, as to um, what we can determine in terms of dosing and impairment. There's a study going on right now in Iowa at NADS to do that very thing. And we're hoping within the next year to 18 months we'll have something. It's not an easy study to do. For example, many people in the room know that if you ingest marijuana today, the chances are it will be a, still a metabolite or a cannabinoid in your system. Uh, Anyway, a metabolite in your system 30 days later, bottom line. So when you have people that come in to be test subjects and they're already, you know, looking like they're dosed, how do you do a baseline? So you have to detox people in order for them to be, to establish the baseline to do your study. These are a very complicated, very expensive prop propositions. We're doing it, 
The question is how long is it going to take and what are we going to get? And I don't have that answer for you now. But we're still looking at about a year, maybe a year and a half, and we hope to have something. Now, there are studies that are out there. You'll see some studies that uh, people have talked about, impairment thresholds and things of that nature. Most of them, and I would commend this to you as we've looked at them, don't just rely on the, what you read. Read what is responded to in the peer review. Because the peer review, a lot of those things, there's method methodological issues. There, there are things that are people have addressed or at least challenged them in terms of the way they were doing things. And that it becomes very, very mixed in this whole issue of marijuana. Same thing goes with crash causation studies. How many of you have heard of the Druid study that was done in the European Union? Anyone heard of that? It was a crash causation study with a huge sample. Uh, involved 13 different countries. And they basically said that there's, and I'm oversimplifying it here, but basically that there was no indication that marijuana caused increased the, uh, the crash risk uh, based on their sample. But the problem is there's a lot of issues in across 13 countries and across 13 uh, uh, with the data set that was there. Not all the countries have collected the same data, so they made some assumptions on that. So we're doing our own crash causation survey, and we're running into the same kind of issues. Uh, we're doing, we, did, we completed the examination in Virginia Beach, Virginia. Uh, we're going through the data right now, and a lot of the same problems that came up in the EU study, the Druid study, is also apparent in ours. So we're not sure that model is going to work perfectly. So again, a lot of the studies that are out there will conflict with one another, and they're problematic. Having said that, some of the men and women in the room who have actually been on the street, who have pulled people over, who have been impaired, and suspected that they smelled like, you know, frankly, they just got off of a pipe or something like that, which is kind of what I used to call a clue in the business, um, would frankly understand that, you know, I don't care what the studies say, this person is really messed up and shouldn't be driving. So we understand that, and we're trying to answer the question as best we can. Now, having move, moving away from the technological piece and some of the study pieces, there's a few things that I'd like to mention that I think are incredibly important going forward. As we talked about the deck training, uh, we believe that that is a huge stop gap and a measure to try and deal with understanding what you're encountering on the road uh, until we get to a point where the technology catches up and we have something reliable, you know, as, as to presence. So we encourage people across this country to take advantage of A-Ride and the DEC program, increase the number of DREs in the, uh, across the country. We can do a lot better in that area. And, you, and all of our regions, including Mike, have pushed that across their regions trying to get that inf interest out there. We're still continuing to work with uh, the DWI courts. We're promoting DWI courts across the country. We're promoting uh, drug courts, uh, sp those kinds of specialty courts, because as, as Jake mentioned earlier, a lot of this is a public health issue, and it can't be relied upon strictly from the standpoint of just arrest and incarceration. Many of these folks need treatment, especially in the area of drugs. And it's also true in the area of prescription drugs. And I have firsthand experience with that. My mother, God rest her soul, was being treated by three different doctors at one point in time. And she flipped out and called me on a phone one time and I rushed over to her place. And there was a PDR next to her bed. And she had 14 prescriptions given to her by three different doctors, none of whom were talking to her and talking to each other. Now this is before cross-matching in prescription at uh, pharmacies. And I went into the ER with her in the ambulance. And I dropped these prescriptions on the ER doctor. I said, I'm going to sue somebody. Fix this. She went through 10 months of treatment. So it can happen to anybody. My mother wasn't a junkie on the street. My mother was a very good, loving person who had a number of different things that was wrong with her. And she got prescribed a lot of crap. And you know what? That's happening across this country. So prescription drugs is a big issue. Treatment's a big issue, and so we certainly encourage people to be involved in that. The other thing we're looking at, we've just got uh, working with the National Sheriff's Association. We're going to be uh, suggesting the same thing with the International Association of Chiefs of Police, getting them to uh, support changing the uniform crime reporting for arrests uh, to deal with DUI issues and break out DUI in a different way. 
DUI alcohol, DUI drugs, and DUI both. So we can have a better handle of what the intake level is, what the men and women in law enforcement are facing out there on the street, because we really don't have real good information for that right now, certainly not on a national level. And last, I would also suggest um, that we are going to go ahead and continue, and we have, our leadership has been very, very strong in this, and we thank David Friedman, our acting, associate, uh, acting uh, administrator. There's a lot of people who wanted to shut down this roadside survey, but the roadside survey gives us incredible detail as to what we're experiencing out on the road. And the sensitivity of this new evaluation is very, very important to us, and we will continue to do that. Because if we don't, we don't have good data. It's very difficult to identify your problem and go after it. And we're asking a lot of people in a lot of disciplines to do that, whether it's the treatment folks, whether it's the cops, whether it's the courts, whether it's the prosecutors. There's a lot of people, a lot of pieces of this puzzle. And we need to understand the problem so we can make effective use of their time, their energy, and their resources. So I wish I had all the answers for you. I mean, I could sit up here and we could talk about alcohol and I could be done in five minutes. But as, men, as Jake mentioned earlier, there's a lot more questions of this issue on driving under the influence of drugs, and the answers aren't going to be done in the next two, three, four, five years. But I can assure you that NHTSA, is across the board, is trying to find the answers we can that are legitimate, that are based in science, based in fact, things that could be supported in court, things that could be supported in treatment and with families. So I thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. Uh, hopefully I didn't bore you with uh, you know, all the quick, rapid stuff. I don't use a PowerPoint unless I absolutely have to, largely because I want to talk to you. And uh, frankly, the data that we have, depending on how you look at it, could change because of the gaps. But it's an important issue, and we're not going to be turning our back on it, nor ignoring it. Thank you very much for being here. I'll take any questions you might have. Any thoughts, questions? Yes, sir. Well, they are, and, and, and that's really not coming under our purview. That's actually com coming in from the NIDA, the National Institute of Drug Abuse. Um, the NTSB, National Transportation Safety Board, came out with 19-part uh, recommendations on impaired driving about a year and a half ago. And one of those that recommendations talked about toxicological assays and testing because there's differences between the states and, and in capacity and cost and all, as I mentioned. NIDA is working on it for the standpoint of uh, drugs in the workplace, and they're coming up with standards and revised standards for that. And they have been bringing, as is their, uh, that's one of their stakeholders, that group to the table to discuss that. It is our hope that from that we'll be able to have some kind of uh, uh, legitimate thing that we can work through the toxicological uh, community, including the medical examiners as well as the coroners, to have a means of testing and evaluating. But yes, they are at the table, but not so much at the table specifically with us. However, they were represented when we had our meeting in the fall of 12 because we wanted to bring them in as well as an, with one of their foundation people in, in DC. Great question. Yes, sir. Does uh, NHTSA have a position on lowering the per se limit to uh, Actually, we don't, and, I, and I'll tell you why. Uh, most of the study data that talks about 0.05, and that's the drink drive uh, recommendation that came out of NTSB, um, uh, that's very common in uh, many of the Western European countries and also in Australia. And uh, we don't have that for a couple of reasons. Our data, number one, doesn't suggest that 0.05 is the cutoff. 0.08 tends to be the cutoff where it goes real, real high. Uh, the second piece is uh, some of the studies that were done are done in communities that are very homogeneous. For example, Sweden is a lot different than, say, the United States. Well, while we've looked at those, we are interested, if a state wants to adopt a .05, we will look at the impact of that public policy decision uh, at, you know, as they go through and we'll work with the state. But no state has adopted that. There have been several states that have introduced bills, um, three states, to my knowledge, as of about two weeks ago. Uh, I've had bills on .05, but they've not moved through committees yet. So we're just monitoring and see what we go. Okay? Great question. Yes, ma'am. 
I was wondering if you had um, looked at some of the emerging technology with cars, um, specifically the driverless cars, and what impact that might have regarding this particular issue, but also just safety in general. Well, yeah, and, and that's a great question. We have, uh, as many of you know, uh, there's a number of manufacturers have talked about coming out with different types of cars that are going to prevent people from becoming involved in a crash. Uh, totally autonomous vehicles. We look at those thresholds on a four-level uh, period. Uh, one is a very basic you know, interaction between the human being and the car. Two, the, number f the top level would be where you get in the car and it's like George Jetson. You know, you just say, I want to go here, and next thing you know, the car drives you there, okay? Uh, we believe that there always has to be some ability for the driver to take over control of the car. We're not doing regulations as yet, but we're having a lot of conversation with the manufacturers. And clearly, clearly, if we ever get to a level where you don't have to drive, except in an emergency situation, that could have a significant impact on impaired driving. Now, as a stopgap, one of the things that we are looking at is uh, it's an alcohol-based sensing device called DADS, which allows us the opportunity to do, um, uh, you know, passively s see whether or not the driver is uh, impaired. And if the driver is impaired, then the vehicle it acts like an interlock. The vehicle won't start. So th that technology is also under development at all. But uh, even if we had the technology today, with the rate that we uh, turn over our vehicle mix across the country, it could take 20 years for that to take place throughout the country. So we can't wait 20 years when we're losing 10,000 people a year. I mean, that's just way too many people to lose. Too many knocks at the door in the middle of the night. Yes, sir. I keep working with the Jeff Police Department. Um, I don't need to send the people here. Um, it's more a statement than it is a question, but I find it hard to believe that anybody would consider legalization of marijuana when there's so many unknowns. They're putting our people at risk on roads to make them more difficult for our officers to enforce the law. There's so many questions. I don't understand why there's a conversation until more data isn't obtained and then make an a, a educated decision. But just to run down this road and allow this to happen is beyond me. We're talking about keeping people safe, reducing the highway fatalities, but yet we're talking about, there are states still talking about this. I don't understand that. Well, I, I leave that discussion, Chief, up to the states. I mean, we, we, we understand that uh, the way the way we're organized as a government, the states have certain rights and the states have the right to address those issues. The states that have it right now, especially in the recreational use, I know that they've communicated to us, they're trying to work through those issues. And a lot of people are watching how they're doing it, including ourselves. Uh, from a national perspective, though, we have to be driven by the data. And a good part of our data are pro is not necessarily totally complete. We are working towards doing it. We can't take a position uh, because of our restrictions on what NHTSA can and can't do on a state piece of legislation, uh, which are mandates given to us by Congress. Uh, we can't take those kinds of positions yet, but I know that a lot of those states are struggling with that, and we'll have to see where it goes. But in the meantime, we're trying to fill the gaps as best we can at the national level. Great question. Anything else? How am I doing? Did I go over, John? We're good? Any more questions? Well, thank you very much for having me up here. I really appreciate it, and I look forward to chatting with you. I'll be around if you want to chat some more. Thank you.